pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. It's so good to be here with you this morning. As you can tell, I have a cold, so my voice is a little hoarse. So uh, thanks for bearing with me through that. Um, I have really enjoyed this journey we've been on as we've been talking about change in our church. Change over time in the people who are here. Change in the way that we do worship. Change in what we're emphasizing in our ministry plans. Change in our leaders. All types of change. And I just want to start this morning, and I don't mean to embarrass them, but I just can't help but mention this. Ryan and Andrea Clemens are here with us, and if we all just want to wave to them right now. Hey, guys. I appreciate you being here, um, and I just want to say thank you for the good changes you brought to our church during your season of ministry here, helping us learn about blended worship. It's still a part of our heritage today, as you can tell from being with us. So I want to thank you for that and the many other gifts you sowed in us. So I, I wanted to put up here on, a scre- on the screen uh, a, a very powerful symbol in the minds of the, of the Christians in Corinth because we know the letter today is written to them and every day when they're walking to the market or going about their business, they would have walked by or seen the temple at Corinth. It was a very large building. It was a very large structure and it was at the center of city life and it was very visible. And I put this up here today because... Um, they always had to contend with this looming in the background. Uh, this temple is not a Jewish temple or a Christian temple. This temple is a, dedicated to a Greek deity, Apollo. And so always as these Corinthian Christians are traveling around in the background, they have this pressure from their city, from their neighbors, from those who aren't a part of their community um, to, to live a different way and to follow their own approach to life and their own God. It's always in the background pressing in on them. And I want to ask the question today, as we think about change, what do we do when we're going through times of change and people are pressing against us with their own ideas? They're trying to pressure us with their own beliefs or challenge our beliefs or try to change what we think. How do we get through that? How do we make sense of that? For the Christians in Corinth, this would have been a big part of that. But what are the looming structures of our day and our lives, the big things that weigh on us? Jim did a great job in the call to worship laying out some of the things that are in the background of his week. We all could do the same, I'm sure, take out our bags and lay out the things that loom large in our minds. But do we hear the subtle pressure sometimes coming from different areas of life that push us and squeeze us and try to challenge what we believe? The question then that we're going to try to work through is, what is our grounding in times of change and challenge to belief? What is our grounding? So let's look at our passage again in light of this question and see what Paul has to share with us. Now, I wanted to just highlight here, if you look at all the text in blue, um, the common thread in this first part of our passage here between the language of foundation and and Jesus Christ. They're the same. They're connected here in Paul's mind. He talks about, you see all the things in in yellow here um, are also connected. This action of laying or building. So Paul's talking about laying a foundation and building with care. And and what does he build upon? What is the foundation he builds upon? It is Jesus Christ. And so the first lesson we have to learn from our passage today is our grounding when all these things are pressing in on us. When we do life, when we're building, when we're working, We always have to remember that what we build upon is Jesus Christ. At the center of our belief system is Jesus Christ. He gives us what we need to get through times of change. He gives us the grace that we need. He gives us the support we need. Now, in this next part of the passage, I want you to look at how many times the phrase temple is mentioned. God's temple, God's temple, God's temple, the temple. Okay, why do you think Paul is talking so much about the temple to the Corinthians. Why do you think he's mentioning this word temple so much? He's not talking about the temple in Jerusalem per se. What is the temple that looms large in their minds? Right? What's the temple? Oh. He's speaking to their context. He knows the pressures of being a Christian in that place. He started the church there. He knows about all the divisions that they've been going through. Some following, claiming to follow Peter. Some claiming to follow Apollos some claiming to follow him, some saying, oh, we belong to the Jesus parties if Jesus would only be for them. And Paul's saying, no, no, no. 
No, no, you're, you're starting to think with a different mindset. You're starting to cave to the pressure. That's not the temple you need to be focused on, people. That's what he's saying, okay? That's not the temple. The temple that you need to be aware of, the temple that you need to be aware of, is your community of believers. You are God's temple. We are God's temple. So when the pressures push us and squeeze us, and we can name them if we want right now, I mean, we could name all kinds of things, the political pressures, the social pressures, the stresses. Let's not look at the visible outside things that are pressing on us, but let's remember the connection we have together as God's temple. It's a special connection we share as part of God's community. And Paul even gives a warning here in verse 17. He says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. It's a very firm warning that when we come together as, as church, as God's called out ones, when we're gathered, we have to be mindful not to be starting factions or tearing apart the unity we share in Christ or obscuring that by what we do or say. Because it, God takes very seriously the gift that he gives us as Christian community, this gift of being a part of his family. And when we tear that asunder, it's a painful thing for us and it displeases God. It's a sacred thing, for we are God's temple. Something to think about. So Christ is our foundation. Our relationship together as God's community is vital to get through times of change. And finally, the third part of the passage, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours. Now I want us just to pay attention in this part of the passage to what Paul is saying about using the present tense of the verb are or is. He says, all things are yours. All things are yours. You are of Christ. Christ is of God. Now, I just want us to dwell on these words real quickly here. All things are yours. Well, that's a pretty comprehensive statement, right? All things are yours. What is he talking about here? All things are yours. Now, he gives us a little bit of, of, of context here in verse 22. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. Now, what do those figures represent? Okay, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, they're different leaders in the church that bring wonderful things to what the church is doing. They bring wonderful gifts to ministry. They're very vital. They're playing a vital role in the early church. They're out spreading the gospel and starting new churches. And Paul's saying, so whether you want to think about this person who's great or this person who's great, that's good. Okay, whether you want to think about the world at large, this huge world that we're in, or life or death, we can be thinking about all kinds of things. But Paul brings us back to the simple truth that all are yours. What does he mean all are yours? He means the essential things to live a God-filled life, the essential things to, to be whole, the essential things that God wants for you are available to you as you are in Jesus Christ. All that you need in life is available to you, whether you're part of Paul's church or Peter's or Cephas's or Apollos, whether you're part of this group or that group, if you're in Christ, you have all you need. You don't have to be down on yourself or feel badly that you don't have the gifts that they do or the unique things going on that they do, but you realize you have what you need because you're in Christ, and Christ is of God. So I'm going to present something to you today. We've talked about this in the past in a sermon series we did a while back, but this is a very simple idea about how to understand our approach to faith as Anabaptists and as Christians. Um, this is based off something that Palmer Becker wrote called What is an Anabaptist Christian? And if kind of follows the logic for a passage today. Jesus is the center of our faith. So when some, going back to the original question, when change comes, I'll, I'll put it up here, what is our grounding in times of change and challenge to belief? So I'm going to try to use this, these concepts to, to get at this, okay? What is our grounding in times of change and challenge to belief? Okay, so in times of change, we come back to this truth. Jesus is at the, is at the center of our community. Our risen Lord, the one who died and rose again for us, it gives us grace to live every day. He's at the center of who we are as individuals and as the church. And he's at the center of how we think about Christian life, how we read scripture, how we pattern the way that we live life. It's all based on his example and through the lens of his life and his teachings. Jesus is at the center of how we think and pray and live. And out of that flows our sense of community. So if Jesus is the center of our faith, community is the center of our life together. Community is the center of our life. So it's really important that we 
pray together and discern together and safeguard the unity God has given us together. That's a, a very powerful thing, and, and we don't want to think as just as individuals or fall into the individual, individualistic culture of our day. We want to remember to do our, our faith in community. That's a gift from God. And finally, the biggest context of all, if, if Jesus is the center of our faith and community is the center of our life, the biggest context extending from all these is reconciliation, which is the center of our work. Reconciliation is the center of our work. So if Jesus came to reconcile us to God and to one another, and then he's created the space for us to be community together where we learn about that and experience that, then he wants to send us out to share that with the world. So we are to carry God's love to all those we interact with during the week. That's why we have this banner up here. It's been up here now, I think, what, is it over two years or something that uh, Katie Troyer had uh, created for us based off of our vision statement. God, we want God's healing and hope to flow through us to the world. It's our, our vision for ministry, God's healing and hope to flow through us to the world. And, and I love the way this graphic displays it. We have Jesus here represented by the cross, and we have the hands clinging to him, which is the church, Christian community, all gathered. We derive our strength and our identity and our life from him. We hold on to him. And out of that flows, it flows through us, his love and blessing and grace to the broader world that we're a part of. So let's think of ourselves. Um, I have some faces of, of us up here. As united in Jesus, united in our sense of community, united in our call to reconciliation in our world. And that is part of our core. That is part of what the Holy Spirit uses to draw us together. So you see all in between these pictures, there's these different aspects of Jesus, of community, of um, the call to reconciliation represented from here, these different I didn't want to use the term shades of gray because that has another meaning in our culture right now, but these different types of grays. Um, yeah, did not, did not want to in any way make connection there. Um, but um, this is what God is doing, working through us here and drawing us together. And so um, as we kind of draw this series on change to a close, um, I really recognize that change is hard and that we might understand the theology that I'm presenting here. Um, it, we might understand it cognitively. But sometimes when change hits, when change hits us, it's very disruptive and, and hard, emotionally hard to work through. So what I want to do this morning as we close is I want you to um, take some time to think about a change that has happened in church or that is happening right now that you want to offer up to God in prayer. It could be a change that is hard for you that you need God's help with. It could be a change that you are glad to see happen in the church and you, and you want to praise God for. But all the same, I want you to, to think about some change you've experienced in church life or in your own life. And I want you to kind of think about that and hold your hands out like this. And I'm going to pray for us in, in just a moment here as, as we close. But I really want you to know that, um, that God has put this on my heart to talk about change with you because he's with us through it. He wants to encourage you today that he's going to bring us through the changes we're facing as a church just as he has since the beginning. And um, as we refocus on mission, it's good to remember that that's how we started out as a mission, um, mission church. And God wants to bring all the changes that have happened over the years into our story in a way that helps us be who we are today and shape who we are today in a positive way. So as we think about change, it can be hard, but let's have confidence that God's going to do something good. So will you please bow your heads with me and, and hold out your hands and think of a change, as I just mentioned, that's either good or bad that you want to offer to God, and I'll pray for us here in just a minute. Lord Jesus, we just want to give you thanks right now for being our foundation, 
for promising that no matter what happens in life, you will be with us as a church and as individuals. Thank you that that promise extends to the end of the age, which means for all time until we all enter your glorious presence in heaven. And Lord, I just pray that all of these uh, changes that we're holding before you this morning, um, changes that have been hard or are hard, or changes that we're happy to see and we celebrate, that you would receive these um, from us this morning and give us the grace that we need and give us the encouragement we need right now, the clarity we need as a church community, as your body of Christ. Help us to make sense of the changes that have happened here in this place and the changes that have happened in our lives so that we can come through them prepared for your mission in our world. Give us a focus on reaching out to others, a direct focus this week of sharing your love with others that is tangible, that we can identify and feel and that others can benefit from and be blessed by as we reach out with your help. And as we continue, Lord, to grow in this mission, this mindset of mission, this uh, season of ministry that we're in and focused on mission, that as we continue to go this direction, that you would help us still make change, make sense of the changes that we're going through and, and have um, a really healthy response to them. And really uh, may the uh, culture of our church and what emerges in our ministry always honor you. And may the changes that happen always be grounded in you and your calling for us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said,